Okay. I think it's recording now. So welcome again to this session. Um, I'm with the Open Texas Conference Committee and I'm again your MC. Thank you all for joining us for faculty perspectives on implementing open educational practices. Please take it away. Yeah. Can you guys hear me? I was having some connection issues. Somebody tell me yes or no. Yes, yes okay. we can hear you. Okay. All right, great. Thanks. So hi, everybody. I'm Cindy Kilpatrick. I am um, in the Department of Linguistics and TESOL at the University of Texas at Arlington. And um, we just want to share some faculty perspectives on our views on open education um, or open educational practices and, and thoughts on what's holding us back. And we want to open a conversation for us to work together to think about how we can overcome some barriers to using open educational practices. So um, we want to start by sharing a little bit about our why. So I have been a fan of um, free resources and open educational practices since I first found out that they existed back in around 2014. I was amazed. I was like, oh, this is so great that this exists because as an undergraduate, I was a student um, who was on scholarships and um, on student loans and I had to work my way through college and there were actually classes that I took where I could not afford to buy the textbook. And uh, one class in particular, 30 years later, I still remember how much it affected me in that class to not be able to have the book. Um, and I could go check the book out to read in the library, but I couldn't take it to class with me. And even though I could do the homework, not having that book in class affected my level of success in the classroom. So um, for me as a student, I would have benefited from free and open resources, uh, but that that did not exist um, when I was in my undergrad. And so I really strive to create free resources for my students and to help make my classes affordable for them. So I'm a huge fan and have been for a long time of open educational resources, but I have not written yet um, an open educational textbook. And we'll talk about why during our session. Kendra. Uh, hello, I'm Kendra Wallace. I'm in the Department of Material Science and Engineering at UTA. Um, my background is in physics and I taught physics for many years before I joined the College of Engineering here in 2017. Um, so I had some uh, privilege thinking <laughs> and was not a fan of open access materials. And I'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, until I realized some of the barriers that students were facing and one thing that I could do about it was I could try to find resources they could use for my classes. Uh, and so I taught a class last fall that I didn't have a good textbook for. And we we're very lucky at UTA, we have the opportunity to apply for grant money. And I was awarded a grant and I worked on a textbook this summer for a course for materials for energy um, that my plan is for that to be an OER book. Uh, unfortunately, the class didn't make, and so the progress on the book has slowed as I've had to take on uh, other classes this semester, uh, but I'm still working on it and understanding that, you know, there are some resources for some pieces that are already out there, and if those are licensed as share alike, I can still use those, and then, of course, there's some material that I have to create, um, but it's a lot of work, and there are still barriers. That's kind of where I am on my journey. And so I think Cindy is going to share her screen and we want to hear from you. Um, I'm going to get the code from, oh, I don't want to do that. Okay, so we're going to use menti.com to do a couple interactive questions at the beginning. Um, so if you go to menti.com and use the code 5627731, then it will give you access to our page. I'm, assu I'm assuming you can see my screen. Um, and we just wanna know who you are. Um, I see some librarians You're working with there. OER, some people <laughs> new to OER or creating or using OER. We're gonna give you a couple minutes to, um, to get there and add to that. Lots of librarians. at least one person who has published OER, that's good. Well, there are 79 people in this. 80, yeah. So. <laughs> 
give them a minute. So while you guys are answering, if you've never used menti.com, one of the advantages of menti.com is that um, once you log in, you have access to those slides. So even if we unshare our screen, if you still have your Menti open, you're still going to be able to see our slides. And Kendra and I really like to see people and not just our screen. <laughs> and so if I'm sharing, I can't see anybody except myself. So um, once we get through these couple interactive questions, I'm actually going to unshare my screen so that you can see us better and we can see you better. Um, but just for now, we're sharing, but you'll still have access to the slides through Menti. Um, as we keep going. So I'm seeing lots of people new to OER, lots of librarians, many people creating OER, and then some using and a few that have published OER. So just for the sake of time, I think this gives us a pretty good idea of who's with us. And um, I'm going to move on to the next slide. So here's our next question, and this is going to show on Menti as a, as you are able to enter <laughs> cost. Absolutely. Why don't students buy textbooks? You can enter up to two uh, responses, and then actually, if you remember something else you want to add, you can continue adding as many as you want. So let's toss that out there. Why are students not buying textbooks? Um, expensive, irrelevant. <laughs> Never um, use again. I like that. Yeah. That's when we didn't yeah. talk about. Uh -huh. Don't need it. Yep. Yeah. Many classes uh, like tell you to buy a textbook and then you don't mm -hmm. use it. Yeah. I like weight. I agree. I don't want the weight of a textbook in my bag everywhere I go. Inconvenience. Don't need it. Don't want it. Right. <laughs> Don't think they'll use it. Oh, the library has it, right? Yeah. Um, of oh. course, they don't have a hundred copies of it. Right. <laughs> right. Prefer other formats. Price yeah. dated. I think that's really important for us to remember. Dated yeah, that's material. One of, definitely one of my issues. I see not used in class on there too. So, you know, stu if, if students have to buy a textbook and pay a lot of money and then the professors don't even use it, then I, I can see, I would, I would not be happy either. It's not very thoughtful, is it? No, <laughs> not at all. Found older cheap edition. Yeah, I think somebody yesterday, um, Samir was talking about asking professors for, um, to tell her how 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 old can I get the textbook and still be okay in this class. So lots and lots and lots of reasons why students do not buy textbooks. And so I think it's important to establish this because this is part of what holds us back is, is we're tied to this idea that students need textbooks. But if students aren't buying and using the textbook anyway, I think we have to think about that. And I, I want to point out cost is the biggest there. That means it's it's the one yeah. that has been stated most commonly is why uh, as as the reason why students don't use it. Um, OK, I'm going to I'm going to move on to the next slide. You can see these on your mentee if you're there. But again, I'm going to stop sharing so that we can see you and so that we can see um, the chat. So um, we want to talk about why we do want to use OER. And we talked about this from a personal perspective, but now we wanna talk about this from the perspective of our disciplines. So um, Kendra's gonna talk a little bit about physics and engineering and why OER is a good idea. <laughs> um, so I, I think one of the main things is the cost. Uh, as I mentioned, when I was in college, college was reasonable, like you could pay for it, including your textbooks. So I had a feeling that buying the textbook was just part of the cost of going to college. Um, but I learned as uh, the cost of college has skyrocketed, uh, that one of the things that students could do is just not buy the book. Um, and that could cause them a lot of problems in physics and engineering. Now, you know, truthfully, the physics hasn't changed the basic foundational physics 
hasn't changed, but there's new information and new materials. And, you know, somebody mentioned outdated materials. That's a real problem in physics and engineering. Um, and there's a lot of classes in the College of Engineering and in the College of Science at UTA where the professor wrote the book. And so it would be useful if other people could use that book without having to worry about copyright rules. And so if they're, you know, grasping that tightly because of their copyright, then what if, what things from what I know about what they're doing, what can I use and what am I not able to use? And, um, you know, so having that ability to modify things that that other people have created knowing whether it's legal to do that, I think matters. And then I think you can get, um, you know, material that's related to whatever's the hottest, newest thing. Um, you know, I opened my dynamics class with a YouTube videos of dancing robots and uh, they're amazing, but that's part of what we're trying to learn to do is how do we program robots to dance and what's involved in that? And I want them thinking, about doing that when, you know, that's not in the textbook, right? Yeah, absolutely. Right, absolutely. And, and I use, or I think in linguistics and TESOL or in the, in the liberal arts in general, there are a lot of reasons to use OER. I'm gonna go ahead and invite you, if you have a particular reason why in your field, in particular, OER is valuable. I'd love for you to go ahead and put that in the chat um, and share that with us. Why, why does your field need OER? Why does your discipline need OER? Um, in linguistics and TESOL, um, so in linguistics, just to clarify, we are not modern languages. We're not teaching students to speak a language. We're teaching students the science of language. And we do that by sharing data sets from many, many languages of the world. Well, I've got data sets that I got from my professors who probably got them from their professors who got them from their professors who got them from a textbook somewhere. But guess what? My set, my problem set does not tell me necessarily where that data came from. Um, and so I don't probably have permission to use those from the original creator, but we don't know because there is nothing on that problem set that tells us where it came from or where we can get more information or even where we can find the solution if we don't have the solution ready made. Um, TESOL, uh, part of our department as well, teaching English to speakers of other languages, we train ESL teachers and we train ESL teachers, we're, we're moving our program online and hopefully we'll be training ESL teachers from all over the world. And it's really important that our students, no matter where they are in the world, that they can access their resources that they don't have to double the price of the book by paying shipping to get it to go all the way to their country. So we really believe that we need to have resources that are accessible to all of our students. Um, I'm seeing some, uh, at least um, Nicole in the chat is talking about social sciences update each month. Okay, updates with new examples, case studies, relatable material for students. I think this is the case. As, as the world changes, we need materials that change with the world, right? You um, see in art history, thick textbooks, because there are so many oh, images. Thank I missed the ones that were up there. So yeah, I love that. Um, we also see in urban planning, right? Um, you want diverse perspectives that are recent and respond to current events, electrical trades and construction codes requiring updates. These are, you know, each of our fields may have specific reasons why we want open resources. And we want to think about that. And we want our departments as a whole to think about that. Um, but while we think about that, we also have to consider the problems with using OER. So why don't faculty want to use OER? So I'm just going to, I'm going to, since I'm talking, I'm going to go ahead and talk about linguistics and TESOL and then turn that over to, um, to Kendra. So, you know, for me personally, and, and here's my why not, right? We actually have pretty decent textbooks out there in linguistics and TESOL. Um, and I feel like I don't have the time to reinvent the wheel, right? If there's a textbook I can use, I just want those authors to make it open <laughs> so that it's free for my students because it's a good resource that I can use. Um, 
I also sometimes teach classes where everybody uh, or not everybody, but multiple faculty in the department use um, the same course shell. Uh, so we might have an adjunct teach a class or we might have another faculty member teach a class that I created and designed. And there's a question of, you know, who's going to use that resource and who's going to get credit for that resource and different things like that. Um, in linguistics, maybe we say, well, we don't need a textbook, so why should I create a textbook? Um, but I think one of the things we have to remember is that open educational resources go beyond just textbooks, right? We want to think to different pieces that we need rather than simply thinking of a textbook overall. Um, so Kendra, how about physics and engineering? So I'm seeing a lot of people put things about mm -hmm. uh, ancillaries and supplemental resources. That's absolutely critical that if you have, you know, access to homeworks and text, mm -hmm. test banks and online homework things, those are things that are very difficult and time consuming to create. So that's definitely a barrier. Mm -hmm. um, my personal initial opposition was because I was involved in the physics education research community mm -hmm. and there were uh, professors, research, physics research professors who had chosen to do their research in physics education and were writing textbooks to teach physics better. And they did provide these ancillary materials and work for workbooks and activities to do in class. And it was very intentional and based on, you know, Socratic thinking and ways of inquiry based science. Um, and the general physics books and initially the open access books were all like based on 1950s materials and the pedagogy of the 1950s. So not only was it outdated, but you know, these things were not pedagogically sound. Mm -hmm. Now there's some stuff out there that's better, but you know, those authors that committed their life to doing that research in physics education, um, you know, they're not gonna provide that as an OER. And um, so I was really opposed to it at first. And that's one of my big things. Mm -hmm. uh, again, reflecting the latest topics. Now I teach a couple of classes in engineering where the professor wrote the book. And again, I don't have control over that. One of them provides it for free on Canvas, but if he provided it as an OER, then other universities could use it. And you, know, and you could modify things. You could take pieces of it and use it as long as you gave him you know, we still got the copyright. So I'm not sure about that one, what the resistance is. Um, the other one, I just am sure that he believes that his having his little self-published book is providing him some cred that he would not get if it's an OER. And that could be true right now. Mm -hmm. I don't think he's making very much money on it. Um, although, I mean, it's a, a lot of students have to use it but if it was OER, you know, UT Austin could be using it and New York City could be using it and other places. But because he's got it all tightly held, he has to sell it to somebody who wants to use it in their class. Um, it's also in general for tenure track faculty, it's not included in tenure and promotion policies. So sometimes it's because the resources are out there. Sometimes there's other motivations. I think one of the things to think about in terms of um, this professor who who wants the cred, right? Um, one of the things that was really powerful for me when I learned about it was Creative Commons licensing. So with Creative Commons licensing, he can still have his cred. Right? He has his copyright. He That's still holds that copyright and he can give permissions that he's comfortable with for how people use that. And I think that's a powerful tool. That's something that I miss in linguistics with my problem sets is that I don't know if I have permission to use them and I don't know who created them or who gathered that data to start with. And it puts me at a disadvantage because students will say that, oh, I wanna learn more about this language. Where can I learn more? And, and I don't know the answer to give them because that's a worksheet that my professor gave me when I was a student that I've adapted. Uh, but also, I sometimes I want to change instructions. Sometimes I want to clarify instructions or I want students to do something different. And therefore, I need to make changes to that page. And again, permissions are an issue. So I think that Creative Commons licensing is, um, is a tool that 
we all need to learn more about and, and use and encourage our students to use as we move toward open educational practices. Uh, one of the things I'm seeing in the chat is this discussion of um, you know, supplemental resources and all the bells and whistles don't exist. And, and you're right, in the world of ESL, if I buy an ESL textbook, if I adopt it for my class, um, I get not only the teacher book, but I get the student book and the student workbook and I get the test bank and I get an extra workbook packet and I get all of this extra stuff. And I have never seen an, um, an open educational textbook that includes all of those bells and whistles, at least for ESL. So I think there are a lot of reasons why we resist using OER because we have materials and it's hard to find appropriate materials. And if we already have them, why should we look elsewhere? Um, in my case, I really wanted so badly for my for my at least one class that my first online class that I was designing to be free for my students that I built it as a totally free um, free class so I it is totally zero dollars for my students but when I designed it in 2015 there were really not any appropriate open educational resources out there for it. So I could go to OER Commons and Google and I'd get like three things for, for TESOL. Um, now, if I go Google, I get thousands of things, but then there just weren't those resources. So I designed it using articles and websites and things that were freely available online, but not necessarily open access. Um, but what that means is I have no control, right? So I have to have students go to that link to read about it. And if there's something on the page that's difficult or something I want to clarify or correct, I don't have the rights to make changes to that page. Um, I also don't control when it's live and when it's not. So I've actually last semester, I made an assignment live where I sent students to a web page to read a particular page and then they had to respond to it. And the industrious students who finished that assignment when I first posted it, had perfect access to that page. And sometime between when they did that assignment and when it was due two weeks later, um, the, the website shut down. And so then my, the rest of my class didn't have access to the web page, and I had to go find them an alternate uh, thing that they could access in order to do the assignment because I don't control that. And with open access materials, um, hopefully, that there's a stable link that's going to be there for them and they can they can access that or if I have permission to change I can make changes or I can share it from whatever source so um I think that you know there are problems with those kinds of things um I also have to say um there has been sort of a misconception for many years that um, anybody can teach English. And I don't think that's a misconception. I do think anybody can teach English, but I think you need some training to teach English. Um, but a lot of people have created resources for teaching English and thrown them up there and they're not necessarily very good. And so now my problem with finding appropriate materials is there's so much out there. Like I said, I get a thousand hits when I go in OER Commons now. I don't have time to wade through them all and figure out what's high quality and what's not high quality. And that holds me back from using them because I don't know, I, I can't just give my students a resource without me having time to check it out first. Um, one of the things that I have done, I'm just gonna take a second to tell you about a, a project I did in my first class that I designed um, because I couldn't find those resources, but I knew students need resources for ESL. Um, instead of me giving them a list of here's a list of, you know, 25 great websites that you can go to to find ESL activities, I created a curation assignment for my students, where from the beginning of the class in every module of the class, the students have to go find some resources for themselves. And I don't ask for 25 at once, I ask for five at a time. So in every two week module, they find five resources, and they have to determine what those resources, what 
what's good about those resources? How can I use those resources? How will those resources help me as an ESL teacher later? And they keep a running list of those resources throughout the semester. And by the end of the semester, they have 25 to 30 really solid links that they can use. And while students don't love this assignment, in the midst of doing it. Um, I have students come back when they actually start teaching English and tell me how helpful it is to have that list of resources because they reference it all the time while they're teaching and they consistently find things on that list that they can do with their students in their classes. So um, for me, I wasn't trying to be lazy. I just couldn't do all the work of finding all those resources for my students. But by having students curate their own resources, it helped them figure out how to find good resources so it was advantageous for them and also advantageous for me because i didn't have to create that from the start um kendra thoughts on on finding appropriate materials in physics and engineering uh, i think you've covered it um <laughs> you know there is crap out there and so you and there's there are things that are outdated so you have to watch when you find something, what's the date on that? Is that still relevant? Um, but yeah, and I think that definitely takes time and having students do it is a great idea. And also um, I found the librarians to be amazing. Uh, at UTA, we have not only dedicated OER librarians, but also we have subject librarians. So my engineering librarian can help me find OER materials <laughs> in engineering. And so, um, you know, I, I use them and I try not to abuse them, but they are amazing. And I want to encourage everybody to see if your librarian can help you. I know there are several librarians on with us here. So now we've told you a lot about what holds us back. <laughs> and we're huge fans of OER, but these are the things that make us stop and think rather than creating. So, so what about what about you? If you're if you're interested in OER, but you're not creating or you're not using, what's holding you back? And I'm seeing some shout outs. Yeah. So so shout outs to our UTA librarians and you can shout out your own librarian from where you're at as well. Uh, we actually do have some amazing librarians working in subject librarians as well as um, OER. Uh, OER. So yeah, so tell us what your, uh, you know, why are you interested and what's keeping you from doing it? Just just use the chat give us some thoughts. or we don't care if you unmute if you want to join the conversation. workload, workload. <laughs> yeah absolutely i think some of those things we talked about before um you know tenure and promotion and mm -hmm. and things like that so one thing that i'd like to say that encouraged me to go ahead and and do something mm -hmm. um so my book is definitely in progress and i'm on a journey um, but, you know, I didn't find something, I had an idea of how I wanted this class to be and what should be in it. And there was nothing that was like that. And so what I realized was there were pieces. So I don't have to know everything. It's not like I had to be an expert. It, it's really, I don't even think it's the same as writing a textbook that you have to get a publisher to sell, because there's a lot of it that's open access that I can reuse under their Creative Commons license. And so there's there are pieces that I have to create, of course. There are things that I have to access that are you know, copyrighted materials elsewhere, of course. Some things I have to write, some things I have to find, some videos I have to add, but it's a process. So all of that doesn't have to be done at once and you don't have to know everything. Mm -hmm. Some of it is just yeah. take a minute to find what is out there that meets your needs. And then, you know, it's just make it iterative. At least that's what worked for me. So we have some great comments in the chat. Mm -hmm. um, 
So workload, we already mentioned alignment to existing course objectives, yeah. uh, support for faculty from Academic Senate, reluctance to get out of our comfort <laughs> zone. I, I'm going to I'm going to agree with you there, Salvador. That is absolutely me. Um, I'm comfortable with what I have. And sometimes I I need somebody to push me. So that's why we're here. We want to push you. right? We want to think about you don't have to go all in right now but what's at least one step that you can make as you move forward um, to, to help move your class toward being more open or closer to $0. I'm gonna let you take the next one. Um, I thought we should put the graphic up. Oh, yeah, sorry, one more. So we're gonna share this graphic that we made. Um, sorry, I have to find my share. Um, so Kendra and I, though we came to this process separately, we kind of had similar processes and how we thought about um, making our course more open or for both of us, it's really important that we reduce cost in our course. So we're actually calling this zero dollar in your course. Um, and the first, the first step for us as instructors, the first step is not what's out there. The first step is who do we need this for and what do we need? So so first, first thing, who are our students? How will a zero dollar or an open access course help them? What level are they, right? So undergrads, I feel like if they're taking a, a class outside of their major are much more likely to sell the book. <laughs> um, or to not buy the book, right? What resources do they have? Is their budget an issue? Why are they taking the class, right? Um, and can they even get a physical book if they're not in your town? Um, so know your students is step one. Um, so do you want to put the PDF in the? Oh, yes. I'll drop that in the chat while you talk. So, um, so if you want to think about for yourself, how to zero dollar a course. Um, and, and again, it can be iterative or it can be a one-time thing, how, whatever works for you, but just pick a class that you would like to consider how you could get that class to zero dollars for your students. And we have made a blank of this graphic. And so you can fill in, know your students. So you have to pick which class you're thinking of and then think about who are those students and how will zero dollars help them? Um, and so Cindy talked about that a little bit, but you have, you put it in the chat, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah so sure. now you have a blank and you can fill in who are those students. And the second thing is to know your course. So what tools and materials are needed? And this is basically, you know, what is your must have, right? These are non-negotiable things. What do you, what must be included for this course? And again, that may be based on some alignments that you have to have, or maybe some course objectives that your, maybe even your department sets or in engineering, ABET sets some of our, our program outcomes. So our courses have to build to some specific outcomes, right? So what tools and materials um, and, and you want to think about how are you going to engage students to meet those needs for your course? Are there interactive tools? Um, Cindy has mentioned Menti, and we've used it today. Um, Socratic, H5P, somebody mentioned that in the chat. Um, these problem sets, videos, I mentioned I use a YouTube video um, just to get people to understand what is dynamics, what are we doing here, why do we care? Um, you may have a language lab. Are there other supplemental materials that are needed? So you need to identify what those things are. So if you know your students and you know your course, then you know what you need to move toward making your course more open or zero dollaring your course. But I think you have to think about where and how are we gonna find those tools and materials? So there are so many, we've heard about these um, already yesterday and this morning. There are so many different OER commons and other repositories out there that you can start with. YouTube is a great, great place to find um, 
to find all kinds of videos. Um, I love interactivity in my course. And this semester, uh, one of the tools that I have found that I'm using is actually H5P. Um, but you know what? There's a repository of H5P activities out there that are free and open to use. And so I didn't have to start from scratch with all of my H5P. I found the H5P re repository and was able to pull in resources that other linguists had created that I can use in my class. Um, you want to talk about government documents? Yeah, government documents are free and open access, and you don't have to um, uh, worry about cop copyright. You can just grab stuff. Um, <clears throat> so if you need data sets, you know, Bureau of Labor Standards, things like that, or um, like I teach energy classes. So the Department of Energy has a lot of information on their website, a lot of educational information and some interactive tools where you can send students off to learn information. And all of that is free. Yeah, it takes a little bit of time, but it's a good place to look depending on what your um, what your field is, right? Yeah, again, curation takes work. <laughs> Have your students help, ask your librarians and other faculty. So that's something we haven't really talked about yet, but um, other faculty may have already done some things. And this is an, an advantage of OER things is that if somebody already did it and it's an OER, then you can use it too, yeah. right? And so working together, we can build more, um, you know, uh, quality materials. <laughs> One of the things I'm super excited about this year is that um, our university sponsors professional learning communities. And this year we're having one on OER. And I'm super excited about this because it's going to bring faculty from across campus interested in OER together. And I know for me, I want to ask questions of people who are using OER and I want to talk about problems they're having and I want to find out how they solved uh, th those problems and what solutions they found. And I'm super excited about this opportunity. So that's also another thing is resources don't have to be out there digital resources are the people around you and uh, finding other people on your campus who are interested in OER and using OER and 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 talking with you about that. But once you find those resources, then you have to figure out how to actually use them in your course. And um, this to me is, is sometimes the hardest thing is where do I where do I start with this? I have all these resources, but where do I start? Sometimes I'm an all or nothing kind of person and I wanna one and done my class. And I wanna go in and I wanna spend hours and hours and days and weeks uh, recreating everything and I want it one and done. And at the end, my course is ready and I can toss it up there and I've done the work, um, but that's not really realistic. So uh, piecemeal is often easier. I, I mentioned I'm gonna start, I, I am starting using H5P, but I'm starting a couple H5P activities in each module. I'm not trying to change everything in the course at one time. Student involvement and engagement, I already talked about that. Collaborative efforts, we just talked about. What other options do you have? Do you have thoughts of other options or other implementation options for how you, how you personally would plan to take those resources and move them into your course so that hopefully eventually at the end, you end up with a zero dollar course? <clears throat> I'm going to turn it over to you for reflection, Kendra. <laughs> <laughs> so I was just looking to see it. I didn't see anybody had put something in the chat, but it's really about you thinking about that for you. And um, we're going to wrap up here in a few minutes and we'll have some time for more discussion if you have thoughts on that. Um, but our last step is to reflect on what you've done and then repeat. So what more can you do to get closer to zero dollars for your students? Um, so look at what you've done and, and figure out what worked and use that again and share that. And what didn't work and, and how are you going to improve that? And also share that. If you did something and you're like, oh, that was a disaster and here's why, you can help someone else also not make the same mistake. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, what maybe didn't work as well as you would like, but just with some modifications, you could do that better. Um, so thinking about, um, you know, what, 
what you've done, the reflection piece is really important. And then you have this blank template so you can do it again, right? Do it again. Absolutely. I loved yesterday. Uh, I forget what the session was called, but it was the failures, right? I think that's important to think about with OER. We have failures. We have things that don't work and talking about them and helping other people not um, not go through the same thing, I think is really helpful. So I'm going to unshare so that we can see each other again. Oh, sorry. I was supposed to I was supposed to show the thank you slide. So thank you. <laughs> Um, the slides are available for download, um, and so is the that last slide as a single page, as well as the blank one that we already dropped in the chat. So we can drop those in the chat for you if you'd like, and we'll also put our emails in the chat. But now um, we're going to stop talking, and we're going to give you guys a chance to jump in and ask some questions uh, or add some comments. C-Y-N-K-I-L. C-Y-N-K-I-L, yeah. So our email addresses were on that last thank you slide. So I just put them in the chat. So feel free to reach out uh, if you would like to get further information from either of us or have other thoughts. But what comments or questions do you have? While you're thinking, I'm gonna try to drop the slides in the chat um, while you're thinking of questions. So how long it takes to build a course um, depends a lot on what you already have. So if you're um, taking a course that hasn't been taught before or like my materials for energy class last year, it had been taught most recently in 2015. And so I felt like that was irrelevant. <laughs> um, so it took me, um, it probably took me a month to design the course to get the idea of how I wanted the course to be structured, my course objectives would be, what I wanted um, the student, what the outcomes would be. And then I looked for materials and that probably, uh, you know, that took several weeks. And I would say, I'm not done with that. Um, that's a constant, I'm still looking for good materials. Yeah. I did use the students a lot of, because there wasn't a textbook, I had them go find recent research publications and present them to each other and then do literature reviews. Um, so I do think that, that the course needs a textbook. So I'm continuing to work on that, but you know, using the students and having them find materials was really helpful. Uh, it, it takes some time. Yeah, I have to say the course that I designed in 2015, where I didn't have a textbook and everything was free to students, um, I designed that course as part of the um, the online learning, the online teaching certificate through the online learning consortium, and so it was 10 weeks of intensive work for the first pass, um, and then it probably took a three year cycle of teaching that class online. Um, and with me modifying it each semester to change out resources that I, I felt weren't the best choice or finding better resources for things and, and bringing in more things before I felt like the class was really solidly put together. Um, it might not take others that long, but that was kind of my experience with that class. Um, and, and Jessica asked, what kind of response have you had from students to incorporating OER? So I will say my students love that the class is free, um, but I, I haven't actually, I have to say, asked that question explicitly, um, but I, I, the students appreciate the organization of the class and the fact that they go out there and use resources that aren't just a textbook because it helps them when they become teachers themselves. Yeah, I think that's a thing that is really valuable about your having the students uh, curate their own list of websites. It's not just that they had now have that list, it's that they learned how to do it, right? And so the some of the value that my graduate students got from going and finding these research publications and doing literature reviews is that helps them in writing their dissertation. We did some presentations that's gonna help them prepare for their defense. Um, so, you know, there are lots of valuable pieces 
to having the students be involved in building your course. Mm -hmm. I think one thing to be careful of if you're not using a textbook um, is that some students really want a textbook. <laughs> and so in our linguistics classes that are built on problem sets, we always have students who say, you know, I feel like I need to read something. I don't want to rely just on my class notes and class lectures. I need a book to read to understand this. And um, and what, what I used to do in the past was I needed to refer them to publish books, which meant they had to go buy something that wasn't even required for the class. They just wanted it as a supplement. Um, and as the field of OER grows, um, I've now found at least some chapters and things where I can send them. So I think that's been one of the biggest issues per se of, of using, um, of zero dollaring a course is students feeling the need for a textbook. Um, in my class, I try to give them plenty of things to read and then plenty of supplemental things that I think satisfies that need. But um, I think that's definitely a consideration you'll have to have. We have a, um, there's actually a really good linguistics textbook um, on OER Commons that I really like, but it was written by a Canadian. And, um, and so the examples are mostly Canadian English, which actually makes quite a difference in terms of linguistics. And so, you know, we really want to, to trade them out. I want to be able to pull that textbook and I want to recreate pieces of it using American English. Um, so Rose, we use Canvas here at UTA. So that's what um, that's what we're currently using. My original course was created in Blackboard, which is what we used originally. And then I had to roll it over to Canvas when our, our campus changed. Um, um, Jessica, I was trying to drop our handouts in the chat and I was not able to do that. Um, I don't know if you can help us with the questions about where the slides are um sure yeah i can i can try dropping them in as well but they also will be um eventually when everything goes into the repository they will be in the um tdl repository along with the recording of this session but i'll try dropping those those files in there too cool thank you so much there's me trying to type them in the chat you just asked <laughs> Any other questions or any other struggles? What are you struggling with that that you would like not us? We're just here to share. We're not the experts, but um, what what are you struggling with? What barrier can we help you overcome? Or what did you overcome? Some of you are <laughs> That's a great idea. Like, you know, share with us. If there are no more questions, Kendra put our emails in the chat. It's been a pleasure to be here with uh, you guys today. Thank you so much for coming. And if you want to talk more, feel free to reach out. And um, some of you UTA people will probably see today or tomorrow. Right. <laughs> yeah, thanks, everybody. Thank we you so much. appreciate all of your input and feedback. And thanks for being with us today. Thank you all so much for a great presentation. I'm sorry I was not able to put those files in um, the chat, but they will be uploaded along with the recording later. Let me stop the recording. And also the handouts, right?